All right. We are back with Chris Vermeulen of The Technical Traders. Chris is going to share with us today what he's seeing in the markets, Bitcoin, gold, stock markets. Uh, we have a lot going on today with the uh, Federal Reserve Board meeting. We have the Russia-Ukraine situation. So a whole lot going on. Chris, welcome back. Good to see you. I guess it's uh, last time we talked was last summer. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while, Greg. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let's just jump in with Bitcoin and kind of, you know, see see what you're looking at there and talk about the conversation of Bitcoin as a flight to safety, hedge against inflation, digital gold, that kind of stuff. Sure. All right. Well, I've got uh, I've got a chart here of Bitcoin, and if we were to if we were to take a look at it, this this is the daily chart, and and really we've seen it, you know, selling off from those highs uh, back in November, and and really there's been a lot of a lot of talk and 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 uh, and kind of correlation about you know Bitcoin and the U.S. dollar and the mass psychology of of when the stocks are moving down or sideways, we tend to see Bitcoin start to be more correlated to the stock market. And I, I find like whenever the financial markets, the government kind of gets their hands into something, it's it, it kind of changes a little bit. Bitcoin to me felt a little more free flowing, and now it's got futures. And now it's got the, the financial markets tied into it. So I think when there's overall panic in the stock market, we see selling, uh, it tends to pull the financial markets down. And Bitcoin is now kind of uh, in there with a lot of people trading futures, trading ETFs around it, that those ETFs, when people are panicking, people sell the Bitcoin ETF, it creates extra selling pressure. So, I mean, I mean, Bitcoin, when you look at it, we're, we're in the grand scheme of things. We're in the, a very large range. Let me just go to a weekly chart here. And if we take a look at the, the weekly chart, uh, you can see we're kind of at the lower end of the range. Around this 30,000, 30, 40,000 is kind of a big lower range on this chart. And uh, we'll have to see if it can get some traction over the next little bit. Uh, I think it's got some room to continue to go up to 50,000, but I think a lot of damage has, has been done. And really, we're going to probably continue to see this trade between um, these lows here, probably 30,000 and 50,000 for a while. I think a lot of this volatility um, is going to eventually kind of pan out and turn into just a low volatility time it, for Bitcoin. Um, I mean, it's got such a, a massive range. It's pretty tough to trade something when it's uh, kind of in, in a range like this, unless you just accumulate near the lows, you want to try and trim near the middle, near the top. But uh, overall, I don't have a whole lot of insight on Bitcoin other than I think it's had that massive euphoric move. It had kind of a second, a double top in here. And now I think it's it's kind of going to trade uh, in this huge range for a while, and, and until it breaks out of that range, um, you know, I think it's it's going to be a tougher trade. Short term moves, lots of back and forth action. So, Bitcoin's it's not my ideal trade setup by, by any means right now. Yeah, it's it's tricky times in terms of trying to project where Bitcoin's going to go and when. And I've been tracking uh, this range that we're in right now in terms of a bottom for a retrace. And then maybe it, like you're talking about a more longer consolidation into what would be known as a bear market or crypto winter. But uh, mm -hmm. I think it's it's trying to establish the base for that consolidation for a longer, more sustained upward move. But with all of the economic uncertainty and, and with Bitcoin as a risk asset, which is what it is, it's tracking the markets and there's so much uncertainty out there right now. It's, it's difficult to project any kind of a near term path. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about uh, gold. What, what are you watching in gold right now? And what do we need to be on the lookout for? Cause gold can be a big, you know, forecasting of economic times. Yeah. Well, gold, gold, I think has been, has been trying to base for a while and it, it had a huge run up and now it's been consolidating for the past, you know, year and a half. And it, we're at this point now we're starting to see series. Uh, it's on the verge of breaking a really significant kind of standout high. If it can break this high around 1880 and, and hold up there, I think that'll be a, a really bullish sign for gold. It has been coming down. It's now starting to make a series of higher lows. And to me, this 1880 is going to be a pretty significant level on the chart. Typically, you want to see the market break um, standout highs. So a standout high, a standout high. These standout highs count as something fairly significant uh, in terms of resistance. And, you know, we're starting to break some internal highs. We broke a high here. We broke a high here. We kind of popped above a recent high. But these are kind of smaller internal highs. These kind of major standouts are, are really important. So I think once we break this, I think gold could be off to the races in terms of 
finishing this kind of rounding formation, this year and a half long base. And then I think it could go a lot higher. When we, when we look at the big picture of gold, we can use uh, Fibonacci extension, which gives us a rough idea of the momentum, which is actually pretty, pretty accurate. I love Fibonacci extension uh, patterns because it gives a really good upside target. And I usually look for uh, the first target to be about the 618 extension. So about a, a, a six of a percent of the movement all the way up 60th percent. And then we've got a hundred percent measured move. So based, based on gold, if it can start to break these highs, we're going to see it start to ratchet itself up here. And we're looking at a 20 to, you know, 40% move in gold, which brings us up to 2,600. And, you know, we're starting to see money really flow into the gold miners. We hear, you know, talk uh, of Russia, Ukraine war and the gold miners each day that we've had that news hit that was fairly uh, significant, gold miners jumped six, 7% in a heartbeat, uh, both of those trading sessions. So if gold starts to take up, which typically gold and oil will move up during war, we're gonna see the gold miners, silver miners, I think follow suit. So we're kind of getting into this perfect storm for commodities. Um, not only that, but late stages of a stock market, when you're getting closer to what I think is gonna be a bear market, that's when commodities come to life. And we've seen commodities come to life. A big chunk of it has to do with the whole supply chain and COVID causing, you know, slowing the whole supply chain down. Um, but we are kind of getting to these point, this level already. So we've got this super cycle of commodities coming into play. Now we've got a perfect storm, pardon the pun, with Russia, uh, you know, coming into, into play here. That's going to make commodities really, I think, take off going forward. So I think there's a lot more potential for commodities going forward than there is in the uh, stock market. Yeah, that's the projections, and especially given the interest rate climate that we're facing and monetary policy, mm -hmm. QT uh, moving forward versus QE that we've been on since uh, 2008 to 2009. And I was looking at the I was looking at the history of rate increases, and it's interesting that rates did not move, did not raise at all from 2008 until 2015. 2015 was the first interest rate hike, and then over the next couple of years until Powell. I think rates just hit 2%, ended up a little bit over two in 2018 when we had the big uh, event in the market that forced the Fed to reverse course on interest rate policy. And yep. uh, it'll be interesting to see how far they can push it this time before they have to turn it around. Yeah, I mean, 2018, and they're ready to kind of cut everything and uh, in terms of stimulus and, and do the rates. And then we had a 20% stock market correction and they totally changed tune and went right back into it, more stimulus and I mean, it doesn't take much for them to change their minds. So <laughs> now, and you can see in your chart there, I mean, gold reacted just like every other asset along the way in response to stimulus going back to that 2008, nine, I think gold was trading around what 300 bucks back then. And everybody I knew was telling me to get into gold back then and said it was going to be worth $1,200. It was just, and it was kind of hard to comprehend back then. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. I mean, the, the, the chart pattern here for gold is, so strong. I mean, we had a multi-year base. It started a bull, a bull market back here in 2019. And now it's got the first major bull flag, which you could say is a cup and handle. I mean, it is really primed and ready to just shoot higher. And I mean, I think if gold starts a big run, kind of like up one, to one of these levels, I think we're going to see, you know, the precious metal sector overshoot these. I think, uh, uh, usually you get into like a euphoric stage where we'll see the price rally well beyond the 100% measured move. In some cases, it can go a few hundred times. So it's going to be interesting, especially where silver goes uh, and, and what Bitcoin will do when all this happens. I mean, when we get a big movement in precious metals, I think it's going to be uh, pretty, pretty exciting, pretty wild. And I think um, I think it could potentially blow us away in terms of where it's going to go. It's been so dormant for so long and kind of suppressed that when it does pop and snap, I think it's going to be, you know, pretty powerful. Yeah. And like you said, global, global conflict would mm -hmm. be very good, especially a Russian Ukraine conflict for commodities. Not that anybody wants that, but it just no. is what it is. And yeah, you know, we've seen that in the past, but um, so you have mentioned a couple of times, you know, significant downside for the stock markets. What do you, uh, tracking there. And when you say bear market, what are you forecasting? Right. So I, I don't think we're, I, you know, we're not that close to a bear market. I feel like the scenario that's starting to unfold here, we're, we're getting some big volatility. I mean, when you look back on the charts, it's pretty, pretty condensed here. 
But when you get into um, big volatility, it looks very condensed because we've had this huge run, but we get into this really choppy price action near market tops. And we're kind of, we started to get into that over here. It looked like the market was about to top, but it continued on. We had lots of, lots of QE and, and, and things happen. And, and we're back into this type of scenario where we're getting into this. So chop go, back, go back to that 2015 again, where the, where the market started chopping up a little bit, because that I think is right around when the Fed uh, started to raise rates after 2008 for the first time around 2015. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we're, we're, we're into this kind of nosebleed section. We've had some pretty big corrections along the way, obviously, but uh, I feel like we're kind of in this just uh, somewhat of a euphoric phase to the upside. And, and right now, I mean, we're starting to see, uh, for example, if we were to take a look at the, the Russell 2000, it's already broken down. It was trading in this topping phase, which I consider uh, a, a distribution or a stage three, which is a topping phase. It had a little bit of a squeeze up, but came right back down. And so the, the, uh, the, the Russell, the small cap stocks have already broken down. That's not a good sign. Uh, they tend to lead bull markets. They tend to lead bear markets. So money's definitely been flowing out of the small caps. And now what we've been seeing is a big flow out of large caps. And that's the opposite of what we've always seen. Right now, the big indexes are actually moving down more and more. The Russell 2000 is actually holding up very well. We're actually seeing positive days on the Russell more times than not, while the NASDAQ and the SP500 are negative. And you know, the majority of the capital in the stock market are in the, the large cap stocks, the SP500, the NASDAQ. So if they keep, are, keep moving lower, that means there's big money getting very defensive and they're moving out of the stock market because we're seeing big selling in the NASDAQ and we're not seeing, we're seeing, you know, buying rising prices in the small caps. So the big money players have already deleveraged their small caps. That's why they've broken down. I think that is done. Now I think the big money is starting to try to unwind and deleverage in the large caps because that's where they're heavily weighted um, and they're trying to lighten those loads. So it's, it's a little nerve wracking in terms of what's going on. I think it has to, a lot of it has to do with what's going on with Russia um, rates. I mean, all of it coming together. I think a lot of money is wanting to get very defensive. They don't know what's going to happen. It makes sense. You got to lighten the load when things become very uncertain and volatility picks up. Um, you can always get back in later. Um, it's better to pay a higher price than to you know take a big loss and and have to ride something out for a long period of time. Yeah, it's capital is definitely rotating. So where are you tracking flows uh, from a flight to safety? Is are you know is it, you think it's flowing into treasuries, gold? Where do you see the capital going? It's tough. I mean, we haven't really seen uh, too much strength. I mean, we see when there's panic in the stock market, we've seen the U.S. dollar hold up fairly well. Um, commodities in general. I mean, if we take a look at um, DBC, just look at the, the commodity kind of complex. Uh, most of the commodity sectors um, definitely moving up and to the right. We're in a very strong commodity market. So, uh, you definitely want to be somewhat in equities. If you're in equities, you want to be something that's probably tied to commodities. I think they're going to continue to push up. They're looking a little bit, um, you know, overdone here. But I mean, this is this we're still in the infancy stage. When we go way back here, we really just put in a major double bottom in terms of the commodity cycle. I think there's still a lot of room to run here. It might not look like much on this particular ETF, but uh, commodities can run hundreds of percentages during this this distance. So I think there's a lot of space, uh, a room to go in the commodity space. Bonds haven't really been acting as a defensive play at all. They've, I mean, bonds are down from the highs a few months ago, about 12%, like TLT, the uh, 20 year plus treasury bond. So bonds aren't, aren't a safe place. Um, the US dollar and I think commodities are kind of the play to be. There's a few different, different country ETFs that have been doing well, like Latin America has been doing really well at that ETF. Uh, but um, really, yeah, it's interesting. You would think bonds would be up a little bit more than they are, but I guess the Fed is still mm. the big buyer out there and keeping rates down for now. And probably, you would think would have to continue, or the you know the debt will, will get out of control for the United States. Yeah, uh, it, it's going to be interesting. I mean, does the forty-year bond market like finally burst? Like, I mean, it's just it's not doing what I think they're supposed to do. Anyone who owns bonds is going backwards. Inflation is way more than you're returning on your bonds. And I mean, the, the, the government, the Fed is just forcing you to take on risk, get into stocks and, and take all that risk uh, just to try to, to keep up with this inflation. And, um, you know, bonds, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens over the next little bit. They have not been in favor. 
Um, there will be a time when everybody flocks to, to buying bonds and things, but uh, right now there's just no return in them. And uh, they actually carry quite a bit of risk. I, I think almost cash in some points, much better than bonds, which, which is what we've been doing. When we move um, out of stocks, we're not even going into bonds. We haven't done that for about a year and change already. We just moved to cash because bonds aren't acting, aren't going up when the stock market's going down. Yeah, interesting. What are you expecting out of the Fed today? Do you think they're going to take immediate action? How strong of an action do you think they're going to take? I don't know. I don't follow the Fed and all that too closely. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what they're going to do. I mean, you can never, never really guess what they're doing. And uh, who, who knows? I don't know. I just listen to the news, see how the market reacts and uh, follow the price from there. Yeah, that's all we can do because you you never do know. And it's really interesting. You, you get Bullard that comes out this morning, speaks a little bit, and the markets react. And, of course, we have Powell. You know, they always play that good cop, bad cop. And uh, yeah. Powell is always much more soft-handed than uh, some of his counterparts. So, uh, yeah, it'll be real interesting to see how this shakes out. Yeah. I think I think if we if we were to look at kind of one sector that I think is, is doing uh, – that has good potential here, I was actually talking about this this morning – it's actually the uh, the the Copex ETF, the, the copper miners. Uh, it, it's pretty interesting. It's had a really nice run. It's put in a rounding formation. It's making a series of higher lows, higher highs. Uh, this ETF and um, XME, which is kind of a similar one, it's it's industrial miners. It actually has some gold miners in it as well. They've they've had the rally that we anticipated gold miners would. You know, after after 2020, the gold miners have been you know trading. You look at gold miners; they're the complete opposite. They're they're down the whole the whole time. Whereas you go and you look at um, uh, like Copex, it's got this potential here that it's starting to to break and pop. And I think we could see these industrial and the copper miners do really well and actually continue to run and, and potentially outperform gold miners going forward. So I really like the mining space. The gold and silver miners are still both in a downtrend. But these industrial miners have just, you know, to me, finished a bull flag pattern and they're leading the way higher. And they've got a, a lot of run, a lot of room to run here based on the size of this pattern. So, I mean, miners are good. Gold and silver miners to me are still in the back seat. But if we do spark, you know, a war here, I think the gold and silver miners will pop very quickly and could actually start to take the lead. But the miner space across the board, I think, is primed and ready for a huge move. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Fascinating times. Well, Chris, I appreciate you taking a few minutes out today to chat with us and share what you're looking at. And uh, any final thoughts you'd like to leave us in terms of, you know, let's say the Fed comes out strong, raises rates, markets start tanking and selling off and Russia, Ukraine, you know, is getting closer to escalating. What, where do we go? What's, what's our play? Yeah, well, I mean, when the market's falling, there, there generally isn't that that many safe havens to go to. I mean, it sounds bad, but cash, sometimes just going to cash is king. I mean, gold can fall. Everything can fall when there is pure panic in the market. We see it over and over again. So if we get into a euphoric, everyone really panics, um, there really isn't a safe haven. During COVID, the only thing that really took off was the U UUP ETF, which is the US dollar. Uh, when there's huge fear, the dollar goes up. So to me, uh, it would be like liquidate, move to the dollar, maybe even the yen. You have to see which one's acting as the stronger kind of defensive currency. Um, to me, those are kind of the two places to go at this point until bonds can prove a point that they can move up while stocks go down. Uh, I don't think you really want to touch bonds right now. So if all hell breaks loose, it'll be cash and move into a, a currency that is low volatility and that should go up on fear. It's a nice defensive, safe play uh, going forward. And to me, the US dollar is probably the most likely play there. Yeah, yeah. Now, what about like emerging markets, foreign currencies, thing, you know, foreign uh, markets, things like that in, in times of fear in the US markets? Yeah, generally most like stock markets go down together. When when things hit, I mean, they most of them pull back. So. Um, and, and, and when you get to those other country ETFs, they move fairly quickly percentage wise. So, I mean, if you want to be defensive and get into something I, like, I like the dollar, it's, it's more or less a cash position, but it also can have some benefits of rising while the fear continues to, to climb. Um, if you were to jump into an overseas, a, a different country, you definitely want to trade a smaller position because those country ETFs can move three, five, seven percent a day which is quite a bit more than the SP 500, uh, which generally moves, you know, percent or, or so a day, which is still a pretty big move for an index compared to years ago. But um, 
yeah, you just got to be careful with uh, jumping to different country ETFs because they can move pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, great. Well, Chris, again, I thank you for taking some time out. It was good to see you and I look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, well, thanks, Greg. Well, take care.